Uh, Exodus chapter 20, but how do we get there? Uh, so in the Old Testament, if you're new to the Bible, if you're new to the faith, there are the first five books of the Bible, known as the Pentateuch. Uh, if you are Jewish, you are very familiar with these five books. And in these five books is the story, the narrative of God's people and how they came to be and then what God's plan is for their life as God's chosen people. And in the middle of those five books, Pentateuch really translates book in five parts, are these things called the Ten Commandments that us as New Testament followers of Christ still look to today as some guardrails for our life. But it becomes a bit tricky, and I'm going to cover that today as we start off, as to how we see these things. And so here we go. Are you ready? That was exciting. Here we go. I mean, like no one, right? Are you tracking? Take some notes. Here's the back story. I already missed the detail and got it wrong first service, but I'm going to self-correct here uh, as I was walking through the story because I'm doing so off of memory and not a lot of notes for this first part. Uh, but the story starts out. There's sin in the equation. Everything changes. Adam and Eve, they are told you can have all of this food, but you cannot eat for the forbidden fruit. And because uh, they're human, because they didn't follow God's plan, they sin. Sin enters the world and has wreaked havoc ever since. And just so you know, as you come in here, you have a problem and I have a problem. It's called sin. And so as they're dealing with sin, God creates a solution for their sin. Ultimately, it all points to Jesus. We'll get there later. Uh, but in the intermediate he creates these laws, and then he has sacrifices for the sin. And so uh, as we start off, there's Adam and Eve, and then Father Abraham had many sons. So you tracking? You remember Sunday school? Many sons had Father Abraham. And uh, we see from his lineage, after Adam and Eve, we're just skipping through the book of Genesis, Abraham has Sarah, who he has a child Isaac with. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob has lots of sons. One of his younger sons is Joseph. And what happens with Joseph? He's the teacher's pet. And Joseph is a kid that's loved by daddy. And that's why favoritism is going to be so devastating. His older brothers take care of business. They decide that that's not right. They can't stand him. They sell him into slavery. And as they sell him into slavery, it looks like this would be a dire part of the story. But this is where the story just starts. And so he ends up in Egypt as a slave. And in his slavery and in his captivity, he ends up rising through the ranks. He comes through the prison system, and he becomes the second most powerful person in Egypt, which is kind of like the world powerhouse. It would be similar to the United States at the time, where everything is flowing through Egypt. So to be second in charge is a massive deal. And so now he is working through the ranks. He has this position of power, and then he reunites with his family as the book of Genesis comes to a conclusion. And as he does that... It looks like all is well. There's a famine in the land. God uses him to eradicate that famine. Pharaoh is super thankful. And it's like, well, if that's where the story ends, well, that would be great. But, of course, we know through the reality of life, that's not how the story ends. And so what happens next is 440 years pass. This chosen people of God started through Abraham is now a massive people group. The Israelites are millions strong, and the new Pharaoh is threatened for obvious reasons. And so Joseph's in slavery, he experiences freedom, now God's people 440 years later in Egypt, and that's where you know like the Disney movie, Our Deliverer is Coming. Right? This is the story of Moses. And so they are now in slavery again because Pharaoh's intimidated, he has them working for him, and God says enough is enough. He rises up the most unlikely of leaders, this guy named Moses, and Moses does not have a lot going for him on the peripheral, it doesn't look like he would be the man, he has murdered someone out of anger, he has speech issues, he could be a bit of a coward at times, but God uses him to show that he uses people of ordinary means to do extraordinary things. And so then the plagues come, God's saying, you know, if you don't let my people go, and Moses is the messenger, then there's going to be plagues, Pharaoh doesn't take it seriously, then Pharaoh takes it seriously, and he says, fine, the people can go, and the people are now sitting in the wilderness and of all this time, 400 years, I can't imagine being a slave, they're finally set free. And here is the biggest kicker, and it looks like our own lives. Because physically we're not slaves, but spiritually we are slaves if we're not in Christ. We're all a slave to something, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But they're finally getting this deliverance. They're finally sitting in the wilderness. And they are set free, but then the kicker is they're set free, and they're not living free. It's like they finally get what they think they want 
And then they turn on God and they turn on themselves and they start doing the same things that we do. We've been set free by Christ at the cross. We've been delivered from our sin. We have the Holy Spirit to use us, to guide us, to empower us, and yet we still go back to the same pig slop over and over and over again, just like the Israelites. And you can actually be set free, but you can choose not to live free. And so then Moses ends up at Mount Sinai. He comes back down off the mountain. God gives him this law, this moral law, that encompasses all the laws that will follow. And then he gives this to his people. And he says this to him, basically, I, I didn't just set you free, I want you to actually live free. And so now as we walk forward, there's just some caveats that we want to walk in together. Write them down on your phones, whatever you need to do. How do you understand this law? How does it have personal effects in your life? I'm going to give you some things that we're going to just say this first week, and then we're going to let them be an umbrella over the next ten. Number one, regarding the law, because we're New Testament believers. How do we look at this thing? Number one, the law is designed in your life. Write it down. The law is designed to protect those under it. And so there, depending on how you see it and depending on how you grew up, you can look at these Ten Commandments and you can go, well, you know, here's all the things I can't do. And that's a real bummer because, boy, those, some of those things look really fun. But when we look at Scripture, we see that these things are actually designed to protect God's people and it's like a fence of protection around us, where on the other side of the fence is a great deal of heartache. And I heard a person say this week, it, it's like each law, the Ten Commandments, is another plank in the fence so that we don't get what we think we want and we definitely don't need. So instead of seeing it as, okay, God's punishing me, he's not allowing me to have fun. No, God is saving you, not just in an internal sense, but he's saving you from the here and now of the train wreck of your life. Because how many of you have lived long enough to know you don't always need what you think you want? Amen? I mean, how many of you have been burned by that? I want this, I want that. You get a little older, you're going, oh my goodness, there's a fence of protection around me that God actually knows what he's talking about. My godly parents actually know what they're talking about. And as I have strayed away, there have been negative consequences in my life. That's God's law on our life. That it's a fence of protection. And when you take away that fence, all hell can break loose. This is a physical example. I thought I'd share a story that's going to kind of narrate throughout the, te throughout the whole message and close today with one of my children. Uh, this is one of my children uh, when he was like two years old. And if you know my family, you maybe know who that is. But if you don't, well, whatever. He's two years old there. And uh, he hung out with me all the time. And this kid was like just, you know, my little sidekick. And, uh, and uh, he's still, well, now he's not as much, but now he's big. But I remember when he was two years old, and I think I've told some of you this story. When the church was small, we would all leave this place. One service, no multiple services, small location, everyone knew everyone. If you didn't show up in church, everyone knew. It was one of those deals. And we would all go to this amazing place called the food court of the Aberdeen Mall. Have you ever been there? So there was a time, let me fill you in, there was a time where there was more than one place to eat. It wasn't just Chinese. You could go Subway. You could go Taco John's. I think at some point that's a pizza was in there. Maybe I'm wrong. Am I right about that? And you could go there and you can eat. And then look at this. You could go there. You could shop. You could actually buy some stuff. And, you know, Herbergers had their yellow dot clearance sale. And I could just update my terrible wardrobe for the next five years for $15. It was a great time. And life was good in Aberdeen. And so we would go there every week and we would eat uh, at the plethora of choices. It was the, Brown, the Aberdeen Mall. And then there was this other thing that's still there, but it looks like maybe it's not up to code. Like, I don't know if I would get on this thing anymore, but there was this playground. Do you remember that? It's still there. And that kid there with the hat on, he always wanted to go fly the airplane at the top. And so he would fly that airplane at the top, and then I would socialize because I'm extroverted, and I loved hanging out at the mall. And so I would hang out, socialize, hang out, socialize. And I remember this one day after church, I'm like, where's Joey? And Ann points to the bat cave or the, you know, the airplane. She goes, there's Joey. He's flying the plane. Hey, Joey. And he's just beating his head against it. You know, just that's, that's what's happening or whatever. And then, then all of a sudden I look again and the airplane doesn't move, but Joseph's gone. And so I'm thinking, well, this isn't good. Not only is this scary, but I could look like a bad parent, which is worse than anything, right? So, so then we start freaking out a little bit and we have our little minions within our church. I'm not the pastor at the time. I'm just going to new life and hanging out and working with youth. And, 
And so then we start spreading our wings a little bit. Well, maybe he's in the movie theater. Maybe he went to check out the newest movie, or maybe he's in the bathroom. And then I'm getting a little more freaked out because I've watched enough Dateline to know that you don't want your kid in the bathroom at the, at the mall, right? And so I, I'm starting to check all these places. No Joey, no Joey, no Joey. I get to the ice cream shop. No Joseph. And then there's this little old lady who's trickling with this little kid with a hat on. just doink, da, doink, da. And then Joey's coming back home. The lost has been found. And I can just remember that feeling of feeling so helpless and so embarrassed. And she bring him. He was all the way at Herberger's as a toddler. Right? Getting that clearance. Right. I don't know. He was heading that way, completely gone. Why was he completely gone? Well, for two reasons. Number one, parental negligence, right? But number two, there's no guardrails around that thing. Those things that were meant to protect, now my kid's missing. This little old sweet lady is saying, does anyone know whose kid this is? And I'm pointing to Ann going, it's hers, right? And if she would watch him more carefully, I wouldn't have to call DSS. I'm so sorry for this tragedy. I'll go look for his father too, you know? So I mean, when you don't have those guardrails, all of a sudden things can get hectic in a hurry. And that's how it is with God's law in our lives. He puts these things in place so we don't end up at Herberger's doing things God knows what. And so they're not punishment. That's the first starting point. The second thing is this. To follow the law is hard. I've been saying this for a few weeks, and I said it on purpose to preface this whole sermon series. To follow the law is hard. You're like, well, following the law is not hard. Well, you're probably not doing it right. Following the law is hard. Doing what God calls you to do is hard. It's like exercising. It hurts, but it's a good type of hurt. Following the law is hard. Disobeying God's law is painful. It's a guardrail. Hard is good, painful, bad. So, for example, to follow God's law, to invest in your marriage, it's hard. Marriage is hard. To tell your kids you're calling it quits, painful. Generational pain. When you decide I'm going to do what I want to do, and nobody can tell me what to do, now you're creating pain in your family dynamic. And God says in his Ten Commandments, he addresses these issues. To tell the truth is hard. To live a life of lies is painful. To follow God no matter what is hard. To covet creates pain. To break down your muscles in the weight room is hard. To never exercise is painful. And so these things are hard, but they are not painful, hopefully. Now, I know that God uses pain, but I'm talking about the unnecessary pain that you place on yourself through your own bad decisions, and then you blame God for when you don't get your way. There's a difference, isn't there? There's a difference between hard and painful, and so God gives us these guardrails. Here's another one. To understand the heart of the law, write it down, you must understand the heart of the lawgiver. There are 1600 and six, 613 laws in the Old Testament, these first five books. Now, some of them are ceremonial, so we don't really worry about those now, but the moral laws we keep, and God says this, that Jesus came not to abolish it, but to fulfill it, and we'll get into that later. And as he has all of these rules, and then the Ten Commandments kind of encompasses all of those ideas, it's the moral side of the law, you understand this, that to understand the heart of the law, you must understand the heart of the lawgiver. Commandments are different from a dictator than a father. That's what I'm getting at. So you live in North Korea, and, and the person, motive is everything. The person that's telling you what to do doesn't have your best interest in mind. Their only motive is to control you, and so those laws are bad. And you have to have a curfew. You have to do this. You can't have this freedom. You can't have that freedom. That's bad. That's bondage, right? So the heart of the lawgiver dictates the reality of the law, but when it comes from your father who loves you and wants best for you and wants to keep you on the right side of the fence so that you don't stray away, that's not a bad thing. It's the heart of the father. And so hear me say this, never look, never look at the law without seeing God's face in the law and his best interest for you as his child. These things aren't bad. These things are good. Here's another one. Kelly Brennan made sure that I was going to say this in church. The law diagnoses, but it has no cure. Well, what do you mean? Well, I'm talking New Testament now. Paul talks about this in the epistles. This is the theological idea of the law, that it does something. If you're in Christ, it protects you. If you don't know the Lord, what it's doing is it's diagnosing you. Things that diagnose, I mean, you can't just stop at a diagnosis. If you go to the doctor, you get an MRI. You know, lately I've been at the chiropractor. If I came to my chiropractor who's in church right now and I said, you know what? My shoulder's really messed up. And he'd say, diagnose it and say, yes, your shoulder's really messed up. So why don't you just go home now? What's that going to do? It's going to do absolutely nothing. And so he has all these weird movements that he does with my shoulder. It's starting to feel better because he goes from a diagnostic to a cure and a remedy. 
And so that's why the law, here's the last one, points us straight to Jesus Christ because the law diagnoses. And what we do when we look at the law is we, in our hearts with humility, go, man, and when I look at the top 10, I'm just gonna be honest, and if you think you've never failed the top 10, then you're delusional. I know now that when I look at God's standard, I haven't met it, and so it diagnoses the problem, and the problem is always sin, and the answer is always Jesus. Because the law diagnoses, but it has no remedy, and so here the last point is this, the law points us straight to Christ. Here's the problem, and here's the answer. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone at some point in their life has lied, cheat, stolen, committed adultery in their heart, looked upon a woman with lust. No one's above all of these standards. And so the law shows us you need a savior. You need his blood covering your sins. In the Old Testament, it was animal sacrifices. It's all pointing to Christ. And so when you see these things, don't look at it through a moral lens of going, well, if I can just knock out seven out of 10, then I'm a pretty good person. No, you are a maybe moral person. You may be a religious person, but look at me when I tell you this, and I'm not trying to offend you. You can follow those rules as hard and long as you want to try to follow them, and you could still end up in hell because it's not about that, and you will never meet that standard anyways. So don't look at this through a moral or religious lens. Look at this through a gospel-centered lens as we walk through these Ten Commandments. And here they are, number one. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. They're sequential. Forgot to say this. I'm going to say it now. Anyone watch David Letterman? Anyone really old like me? Remember the top ten? What's the biggest one? Wake up. I am too insecure. Wake up. What's the biggest one? It's number one, right? So the number one thing is the most important. These things are the same way. It starts with God. He's the most important. It's God, 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 and then it's man, how we treat each other. And so this is the granddaddy of all the Ten Commandments. We could have gone through them backwards to get to the last most important one at the end, but that's not what we're doing. Chapter 20, top 10, here it is. This is what encompasses everything else. And God spoke all these words. He comes down from Mount Sinai. I've delivered you from Pharaoh. I want your heart. Follow me. You've been doing all of these things, and I want you to stop. But before you ever get there, hear me say this. The first commandment, I am the Lord your God. Why do we not believe that that all religions are the same? Because God says in his word, I'm the only God. I'm the one and true living God. Everything else is a lie. Everything else is a lowercase God. It's a lowercase g in your life. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. This is what's so cool about this text. He says this to his people. Before I ever asked you to follow me, I already delivered you. Who strikes first? It's God. And he says something very specific that we have to understand because we think it's for then, but it's for now. He says this, I have brought you out of slavery. And so we look at that in our modern times where we all, if you're not repulsed by slavery, you should probably please leave now. We all look at slavery and we go, oh, that was horrible. And then you study history and you go, well, it it was almost always existent and still existent in parts of the world today. And we look at it and we go, well, we're not for slavery, so how does that apply to us? But, but morally and, re- and spiritually and emotionally, we're all slaves. That's what the Bible talks about when it talks about what we would refer to as addiction. So we say modern things like addiction, and what we're really saying is we're enslaved to something that we can't control. And spiritually, that's all of our plight. And so as far as that goes, 2 Peter 2.19 says, For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. And the broader idea is this, when you worship anything but God, capital G, you are then showing that you are slave to that thing that you choose to worship. You worship false gods. For example, if alcohol is a god in your life, then what are you a slave to? You're a slave to the bottle, aren't you? If sex is a god in your life, then you become a slave to sexual immorality. If you are the God of your life, then you become a slave to your own ego. If you're addicted to your job, you're a slave to the identity attached to your finance and your position. 
Ever met those people that's like, even when they leave work, you still have to call them doctor? Or they, you know, I'm not trying to step on toes, but like, who are you? What do you do? And it's the first thing they start with is their title. We become slaves to these things. If you're addicted to beauty, you're a slave to body image. If you look around what's going on in the world today, you will see this absolutely everywhere. And here's the scary part. It's not outside of us. It's inside the walls. It's happening all over the place. Here's a key sign. We'll get to some of the questions in a little while. Here's a key sign that you're worshiping something other than God Almighty. When it's not just something that's important in your life, this is, this is good. You need to hear this, okay? It's not just something that's important in your life. It's something that you have marked with your identity. It's not just something you do. It's not just something that's important. It's something that if you took it away, you wouldn't even know who you are. That's a red flag. That means that you are worshiping something other than Jesus. And we look outside of the walls of the church and no one tries to hide it. Like we take things that are God things and good things and we create them in a way that are evil in our life because they manifest in a way where they become God-like. And it doesn't happen outside of the church. It happens also inside of the church. But it's more just screaming in our face in the world around us. We see it. But we don't own it. Let, let me give you a great example that's controversial because why not, right? Watching the news or you're watching social media and you've got these clips of people freaking out in the streets with signs. Have you seen that? So you live under a rock. You haven't seen that. Are you tracking? And everyone's arguing and everyone's fighting. And then it's like the biggest hot topic today is sexuality. And people worship sexuality and culture right now. Here's how I know they worship it. They don't just have sexual preference. What, what do they say? First service didn't get this right, so I'm just going to kind of lead the horse to water here. When you ask someone about their sexuality, what do they call it? Their sexual what? Say it out loud. Their sexual identity. Even if I'm not a Christian, that's scary. That all that encompasses who I am, what gives me value, what expresses my own personhood, is that I will go as far as to scream in the streets and hate someone on the other side of a fence because I am saying to myself and I'm saying to you, this is who I am. And that's what happens when we worship false idols. We take them from a place of importance to a place of identity where it defines who we are and we don't know what to do if we don't have it. It's happening all around us. People don't know what to worship. There'll always be a vacuum of worship. We were designed to worship. So then our preferences become our identity. And we get wrapped up in it instead of Christ who is saying, man, it's, it's me and me alone in your life. I am the only thing worth the identity status in your life. And any time you worship something else, the chips are going to fall. Anytime you worship someone else or something else, you're going to end up in spiritual slavery at the bottom of Mount Sinai. And so he gives us these Ten Commandments, and he says right out of the gate, I am God. And make no mistake, I am God, and there are no other gods besides me. There's no other identity besides me and me alone. He lays out this case, and he loves his people. And I said last week, this thing too, to kind of preface this whole idea, is that it's not God's the most important, then there's family, then there's, you know, whatever. It's not like a top ten list of our priorities. It's Jesus is at the center when you get saved, and then everything else you do is working outside of that circle to bring glory to the middle of the circle, which is Jesus. He's everything. He's a groom that refuses to share affection. He's at the center of your marriage. He's at the center of your money. He's at the center of your possessions. He's at the center of your sexuality. And we get this when we just think about it rationally because the whole idea is the metaphor of our marriage. I mean, who in here would, would come, especially in Aberdeen, South Dakota, would, would come to me and even admit, because they'd be too embarrassed, that they would come to me and say, you know, I, I told my spouse I love them, but I want an open relationship. Who in here is married? They go, if, if my wife said that to me, that, that would be it. That's a deal breaker because I don't share my affection in that way. Intuitively, God gives us this wiring to understand through the marriage covenant what it looks like to be betrayed. What it feels like for someone else to have a piece of the heart of the person that we're called to love. 
You would never go for that. That would create rage in your heart if your spouse said something like that to you. Why do you think adultery is so incredibly painful? Because it breaks down trust and shared affection isn't God's design. We all know this. Our love for our spouse is exclusive. It doesn't include someone else in any capacity. And God's looking at his bride. He's saying, we're married. You don't get to run around with any other gods but me. And when you think about it, you think about it through that lens, how awesome is that? That God loves you with that type of heart where he has a groom's heart for you, where he's protective, where he's exclusive. And he says this, I brought you out of slavery first. I first loved you, and what I'm calling you to do is love me. Don't we all know on a practical level when we don't play this out how devastating it is, even on the peripheral? I have been exhausted this past six months with people's stuff, and I don't say that to be critical of anybody, but there are common denominators that you need to hear without letting go of any confidentiality. There are common denominators in how it works when people aren't living in God's design. So, for example, when it comes to infidelity, People will come to, to me and they'll want to meet and God can do amazing things through that. I've seen people where, you know, they, they come to you, they're broken and they're repentant and they say, I can't believe I did this. And then they look at their spouse and they say, I know you can't trust me right now and it's a powerful moment, but I'm going to show you that I'm committed to this marriage and I never thought that this would happen. And I'm not saying it always works out when that happens, but there's a high rate of return because there's repentance and there's humility. The second case study is all too common. Someone comes in in a lot of pain and a lot of brokenness, and then you dig deeper and you find out that they feel bad, but in their own narcissism, the person they feel bad for is themselves. Because who do they worship? Self. And so because they worship self and because they have these false idols in their life, all of a sudden now it manifests in these issues like their marriage. So God says, I'm not having that. I'm the first person and there's no second. So as we, as we close out, we're going to do a diagnostic because there, there's a diagnostic here that's critical. How, how do you know if this is your struggle? First off, it's all of our struggles. No, no one's above this, so it's not a matter of if you struggle, but what is the level of struggle? How do we know if we're being unfaithful to God? How do we know if things have become God-like in our life and not just things that are good? What exposes our hearts? Here's the first question. Who, write it down, I can hear pins click, write it down. Who, and ask throughout the week, you can study this with your spouse or your kids or whatever you want. Who or what do you live for? And then the cheap, cliche answer is, well, I live for God. But, but just be honest with yourself. What in your life, if you, if you took it out of your life, would equal hell? And, and what if you had it would equal heaven for you? Who or what do you live for? As much as you love your marriage, is that what creates a life worth living? As much as you love your children, is that what creates a life worth living? As much as you love your career, is that what creates a life worth living? Is it your marriage, your children, your promotion, your house, your beauty, your sex, your pleasure, your comfort, your sport, whatever it is. Good things become God things when they become worshipped at the top of the food chain. And then it becomes bad and then it becomes destructive. And so who or what do you live for? Here's the second question. Who or what can you not live without? The Apostle Paul's in chains and he says in the epistles, he says, I've learned to be content in every situation. Is there something in your life that has moved from a place of importance to a place of identity? Well, now it's a huge problem because God doesn't share affection. And it's just the beginning of what's going to destroy you. Here's very telling, very telling in my own life. Who or what do you run to in times of need? We all run to something. We all have an altar. But think about it. Don't, don't answer it quickly. Obviously, don't say it out loud, but just think about it as we're closing this thing out. When you're stressed, when you're broken, what's the first thing that you need to feel better? What's the idol in your life? So we'll just use a classic example. Your, your job stinks, but you have to keep it. You, you can't afford to lose the income. You've got you know, five kids at home, whatever your story. And so you come home, 
and the first thing you need to feel better is two glasses, three glasses, four glasses of wine. And you say, well, I'm not an alcoholic, but I am starting to abuse it. And what it's showing in your heart is it's taking this place of prominence where you're running to that altar of alcohol. You're feeling the weight of the world, so what do you turn to? And so it's probably some form of addictive substance in your life or alcohol or, you know, you can't calm down unless you look at pornography and no one knows it's about you, but this is what you do. Or maybe it's unhealthy relationships, so you bounce from person to person to person to try to get that feeling of calm in your life and now you're in your mid-30s and you have this trail of tears in your life of broken relationships and you look around and you say, life's not fair and God's looking at you and he's saying, follow my commandments, follow the guardrails, these Rules are planks in the fence that are designed, if you are in me, to be a protective cocoon around you. What do you run to in your deepest times of need? Here's the last one. And this will expose a lot in your heart, and it does for me. Who or what causes you the greatest joy or the deepest grief? Who or what causes you the greatest joy or the deepest grief? What has the potential to wreck you when it doesn't go your way? Because that thing that has that capacity is telling on you. And here, here's what's so tricky. We can think we're spiritually growing when we're just maturating physically. And what I mean is there are things that were godlike in my life when I was young that now have a position of very low importance. And that doesn't mean I'm more spiritual. That just means my false idols have shifted. So I'm in my 20s, things that I think, you know, if I have this, then that's the end of the world. If I find the perfect spouse, which I think is in daycare right now with your kids, if I could just have that, then I've arrived, right? Well, then you get married, you're like, oh, there's issues, right? It's hard. If I, if I could just have this, and, and so then you grow out of that, and you think, well, I'm really growing spiritually. No, you've just shifted to some other false idol. You get into your 30s, especially if you're a guy, not to be sexist, and you start freaking out with your identity. You're going, I have to ach- accomplish something in my life. I, ha- I have to be somebody. I have to have some type of status, and so you can take good things. Like when I started preaching, for sure, I was so insecure that if we didn't have s- certain statistics and numbers and people coming to church, well, then all of a sudden in my own immaturity, I'm failing. Like th- this is just weighing on me, not for spiritual reasons because souls matter. It's because I have to accomplish and I have to achieve. So what's the newest and greatest fad so that I can be the best pastor and have the biggest, I mean, I'm just telling you the truth. This stuff happens, right? And we go through that. And then I get older and I think, well, I used to be so spiritually immature. I don't deal with that anymore. No, I just shifted again. Now my kids are old. And now I'm falling around my little false idols like everyone else is. I'll close with this story. I was sitting at the basketball game last night in Mitchell, in this palace of corn. And I thought to myself a few things as I was looking at the corn, not only on the outside, but on the inside of the walls. I was thinking, I wonder how that planning meeting went when they said, what are we going to do with this place? And then someone stood up and said, let's make the entire thing out of corn. And it's great. Like, it's the best place. It's, it is the mecca of high school basketball. When you go to the corn palace, it's like you have arrived, and it's an invitational only, and, and there was this guy, he was about 80 years old, he probably had a grandchild or maybe even a great-grandchild on the team before us, and I've done the same thing the last week, I've screamed at the top of my lungs for stuff that doesn't even matter because my little false idol is being affected, and, it, and I moved from false idol to false idol, and now I'm at the teenage stage where, you know, I have to protect my own children, and they have to accomplish, and they have to succeed, they have to be seen, and so now my little toddler has grown up, and he's got long, weird hair, and he's this big ogre of a young man, and now he has to perform, and the problem is he's a football player playing basketball, so it's always like, is he going to do okay? Is he going to run someone over? I mean, it's like Billy Madison, where, you know, I'm the first guy that ever took a skate off and tried to kill somebody, and I mean... No one's tracking with that analogy. I mean, so I'm watching him, and I'm watching all the other kids that I've known since they were in grade school play, and I'm I'm like biting my nails. Please don't mess up. Please don't mess up. Please don't mess up. Please don't affect that false idol in my life. Because in my delusion, if they can just win, then it's all going to work. And they're playing the number one team in the state. They're number two, wherever that works. And they, and they win. And it's like, well, okay, all the parents are happy, except for the kids. Their kid didn't get the right playing time. And then there's some sulking there. And false idols are manifesting all over the facility. There's eight top teams in the state. Everyone worshiping their idol, bowing before that throne. 
all hoping that their little precious baby gets the opportunity of a lifetime. And my point is just, it's so simple. My point is, don't ever mistake spiritual growth for physical change. For life stage change. Because these false idols, if you don't kill them and crucify them, they just bounce around. You know what's next? Hopefully, one day, one day, grandkids. And then I'll have a full quiver, won't I? And then I can hover over them and go to their stuff. And then I can spoil them rotten and blame their parents for being so tough on those little kids. And I see that happening with grandparents all around. It's like that's how it goes. And then that becomes the false idol. And it goes on and on and on and on. And God is saying, I am the groom. You are the bride. I am your affection, and if you don't get that right, you're going to worship anything and everything, even good things that become God things. Good things. Where are you at with these questions? I always see the basketball team in here every week, second service, so it's like, well, where are you at with this? See a kid that was like the best kid ever at Aberdeen Christian, went to Northern, it becomes way more difficult, and, and then I like talk to him as an adult, and it's like he's starting to figure out, hey, I love basketball, but there's actually more to life than it. Hey, I want to get married, but there's actually more to life than it. I want to have kids, but there's more to life in it. I want to have a great career, but there's more to life in it. God is the object of my affection, and I'm going to refuse to bow my head at anything that's man-made as I start this series off the top ten. Amen? God is the object of our affection. No more false idols. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the hope that we have in you. We would ask that as we start this thing off and we look at your list of things that are designed to give us guardrails around our life, designed to, to show us our need to turn to you and trust in the work of the cross. That as we start off, we'd start off with the most important concept that you start off with, which is to say, God, I commit to you. You are the center. Even these things that are good, they will not be defined by my identity. And so as I'm asking myself these questions, and I'm kind of just mulling them over. You know my heart. You know where I've fallen short. You know where I've transferred idol worship. But God, I'm committing to you to just dig into your word and to obey you and love you and serve you because you are my center. We lift up this whole idea to you, Jesus, and we pray this in your name. And everybody said, amen.